we have a high hope if we can walk together trust each other respect each other we could win the battle you know after the pandemic hello uh, i'm welcoming everybody to the uh, havel channel and uh, i have a real honor and uh, pleasure to welcome today with us here a really special guest uh, the leading intellectual the right uh, surgeon human rights uh, activist uh, former political prisoner from Burma from Myanmar Matida welcome to Prague it was really real honor and pleasure to welcome you here in this city to welcome you in the Václav Havel library the library of the men who who always supported uh, Burma who always supported democracy in your country and who has been also the great statesman and the great writer welcome Thank you so much. I also feel very privileged and humbled to be here. Really, yeah, I admire the, the Mr. Harvard a lot, and I, I also admire you too for your interest in our country. It's not just the lip service. You both, the, the especially the Mr. Harvard, the way he contributed for our country is unbelievable. Miss Matilda, uh, you are the writer. Uh, have you written anything since the February 1st, since the coup, and what the literature, what the poetry is doing now when you are facing the terror, when you are facing the war of the army against the people? Well, I have been writing, and for the very first few weeks, it was pretty much of surprise. And then it was too much emotional and too much busy with the resistance and disobedient movement. But, you know, as a writer, what else can we do more? So I write. But especially you might notice about the uh, revoking the licenses of the some TV channels and some of the media agency. And also they revoke the licenses of the some print media. So on March 17, that was, I uh, as long as I remember, it was the day the all the print media uh, who uh, which can distribute it all over the country was stopped. Pr pr I mean the print private media. So on that day, I started using my uh, social media writer's account. I have two different accounts. One is my private account and my writer account. So uh, that, that it was uh, page, the writer's name, Anda Matira Sanchao. And I started writing on that page in order to do my resistance keep going on. So I have been writing uh, dozens of articles already. And I also now keep posting the translation of a, a collection of essays by a young Chinese. And these essays really reflecting the Chinese society, not just that, but also our society. That's why I keep doing this. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you have yourself uh, been sentenced to 20 years of the, of the jail. Uh, from these 20 years, you spent six years significant part of that on a solitary confinement. Now there is more than 5,000 uh, activists, political leaders, but also writers, actors, celebrities, students, monks uh, who have been detained by the military junta. What they are going through now and, and how it looks like in a, in, a, in, a, in a Myanmar military detention? Well, it's uh, compared to in our days in 88 and 90s, this time is more cruel and more randomized, you know. So I think this time uh, a lot of writers felt pretty much uh, tasteless about what they're supposed to do, you know. And then the, since a lot of uh, periodicals and the literature magazine has been stopped, people, especially writers, couldn't find any particular space to share their words, something like that. And uh, some, uh, especially poets, were detained and sentenced. So it's the pretty much uh, bitterness, anger, and fear are overwhelming the whole uh, arena of the 
literature war and the media. A lot of media persona has been detained and sentenced. So I think this time it's pretty much gloomy, the whole situation. And you might notice about the problem of misinformation, disinformation and fake news. It was like a, a powerful weapon for both sides mm -hmm. right now. So it it's not just a uh, weapon to uh, make the other side defeated, but also make the whole society defeated in the sense of freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. So it, it it's totally pretty bad situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you... Uh you are the part of that society. I think everybody of us who is in any way now connect, connected with the Myanmar is, is really kind of a feeling that this terror is kind of entering in our mind and in our soul as a, as a poison. Uh, how you are coping with that, let's say, how, how, how we can cope with this kind of the terror which is blowing our mind, is blowing our souls? It's really, really hard, you know because uh, very innocent civilians has been uh, pretty much cowardly and cruelly uh, detained, beaten and uh, killed. That kind of uh, atrocities making us in uh, despair. It's, it's really hard to cope with what's going on because we, you know, we couldn't do much to prevent it. You know, the total issue of rule of law has been finished already. So we really desperate. We want to help people. We want to uh, help people to regain their sense of consciousness. But I, I feel a lot of people lost their consciousness in the sense of uh, bitterness, anger, etc. So it's really hard right now. That's why I feel a lot of people are in deep depression, either are in deep depression or uh, kind of the uh, ultimate rebellious mood. So it's pretty hard to keep balance in our sense right now. It's really challenging. And by profession, by education, you are you are a surgeon. You are basically uh, work has spent let's say some time working for the for the famous uh, Muslim uh, free hospital. The doctors have been on the forefront uh, and the medical staff on the on the forefront of the of the civil disobedience movement. Also, teachers, civil servants, uh, bank cl clerks. So these are not the usually revolutionaries. They are not the people who are who you imagine as the first one to take the street and 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 why why they have uh, joined the protests? Why they have been such a strong driving force? Uh, to to confess it, I I really feel very proud of being a medical doctor too. In this sense, you know, since 1988, you might notice about the role of the medical doctors and the lawyer in 1988 was very crucial. They were the uh, two intellectuals group stood very fast against the military coup in 1988. Now this time, you know, when we look at back the 2019 and 2020, uh, as soon as the pandemic started, the role of the medical professionals in combating the pandemic together with the uh, NLE government, it was really crucial, you know. They were the frontline defenders for the pandemic. And then they, uh, together with the other uh, volunteers and uh, even the business people working together with the uh, government they trusted, it went pretty well to combat the, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, especially throughout 2020, you know. So I think the other medical professionals having in mind, uh, they really uh, ready to fight against the COVID-19. And then all of a sudden, the military could make things all gone, you know. So they, 
they, that's why a lot of the medical professionals got so angry with the coup. They, this kind of the planning to against the pandemic, it was not very easy. It needs a lot of preparation. It needs a lot of contribution. It needs a lot of cooperation. They have been founding the basic things already, but it was free. So I think the medical professionals, they, they hope we can overcome as a, a third world country in Southeast Asia. We were the very, very advanced stage in combating the pandemic. And then uh, at the same time, you know, when we look at the uh, civil servants from the education, you know, Ministry of Education, they have been very... Uh, RDR's effort during the election in 2020 uh, November under this the pandemic measures you know pretty much uh, very hard working for the teachers from the Ministry of Education as the one who responsible for the polling stations you know mm -hmm. they did a lot of effort and their role in the election is not to make a political party to win, you know, they really dedicated to the job they're supposed to do as a kind of the uh, staff to making sure the election is free and fair, something like that. They have been really proud of being part of this kind of the election. Mm -hmm. And then because of the, food, the, the coup, you know, their role, their contribution has been pretty much undermined. They... Mm -hmm were also being accused by the the uh, dictator, the military hunter, you know, not not a uh, decent handlers for the election. So they got so angry, and then I think the a lot of other sectors they also feel they uh, we already have such a big hope after this twenty twenty election, next five years and. Uh, uh, NLD government will bring so much hope, especially the the uh, the way we work together and the uh, NLD government during the pandemic give us a lot of hope. You know, if we trust in one government, we can work together easily with full extents, and then we will win any kind of the battle together. Mm -hmm. That make the whole society very high in the hope, even though we are not very, very happy with the last four years under NRE government. But we have a high hope. If we can work together, trust each other, respect each other, we could win the battle, you know, after the and, pandemic. And, and is that what you are describing? It seems to me really very, very important that, that in a certain way, it that's really explaining why the resistance to junta is now so strong. Because basically the different segments of society in the last five years, ten years, have really gained in a certain way ownership over society. They gained this initiative, they gained this belief that they can influence and make the country better and suddenly somebody is again stealing it from them and then pretty much everybody said, no, we don't want to let you steal it once more. That's so true. Now people came to their mind and proving that they are the key stakeholders of the society, of the country, you know. In the past, the role of the civilians, the laymen, the ordinary people, never being uh, rightfully estimated by any other stakeholders, you know. The government thinking, oh, people are not well educated enough, nor smart enough, or even the international community or the civil society organization like ourselves, uh, always asking the people, oh, you should do such and such, you should be uh, doing this, such and such. But during the spring revolution, the way they contributed to the disobedience, the way they contributed for the revolution, making sure that they are the key stakeholders to make a change and to make a strong message towards anyone else, saying that without our voluntarily will, nothing can be happen. So they came to their mind and they just proved that they are the key stakeholders 
of the change of the country. So I'm so happy. Uh, we who, who know Myanmar as well as you know, or a little bit as I, I know, we know how uh, kind of the leadership is important in that country. We know how uh, in a society in which since you are two years old, you see the monk and you bow. So somewhere deep in yourself, you always bow to the, to the authority, whether leadership or, or, or religious or political. Uh, but now the key leaders are detained. And the new generation, the mid-generation, the very, very young generation has taken over the leadership. Are they somehow different? Well, sure. I think the the current generation, they are, you know, the if we look at back to the history, you know, our generation is more or less under the censorship propaganda. So it was pretty bad, you know, that the knowledge about uh, I just want to say that the horizontal knowledge or the vertical knowledge about our generation is pretty much limited in that way. But the current generation, the Generation Z, because of the uh, influx of the digital technology and the uh, kind of uh, relaxation in the sense of the censorship, I, I, I just don't want to say no more censorship, no more propaganda. These kind of things are subtly going on, even during the civilian governments. But the way they can reach out to the knowledge, the way they can reach out to the uh, kind of the understanding of the, the the society or the international community has been pretty much different already, you know. And then they have less trauma compared to our generation, you know. That make more promising future by their contribution, you know. That's why the way they act during the first month of the uh, Spring Revolution, you know, it's more non-violent but still pretty much cooperative. And uh, it's, it has been shown already the... The people of Myanmar, uh, especially the Generation Z, is the best deserved population to have democracy and human rights in Myanmar. So that, that's how I appreciate them. Uh, do you think that something is very important is now happening between the democratic stakeholders in Myanmar or people supporting democracy and people supporting the federal uh, arrangement of the country. Uh, we know that the deepest problem of Myanmar is the lack of the internal cons consensus, how the state should look like between the different nations living there. Is something important happening in this, that uh, 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 dimension of the identity of the country? Well, yes, I think uh, I keep saying compared to uh, this revolution and the 88 revolution, what we have missed during the 88 revolution throughout the history, you know, we just think of uh, combating the dictatorship, the military dictatorship. We just want to knock down, but we cannot have enough uh, time to focus on building the society, making the census among us. That's why I think uh, I have been writing a couple of uh, articles about uh, finding our national identity consensusly, that was the big challenge and that was what we missed, you know. It should be done. It should be easily done through the national convention throughout the history, but it was missed by the consecutive military governments, you know, even at the, the uh, peace process during the last a couple of years. We should have focused on this national identity census on uh, what kind of society we really want to build on, it was pretty much missed. That's why right now it was really hard to make a census again, how to do the federal uh, union or uh, the, the, the federal, uh, even for the army, something like that. So I think we, that's why I keep saying, okay, uh, we should focus on the revolution. I do agree on that. But we should also foresee what kind of society we should really build or we can have a census about what kind of new society we really want to live and build. That's 
should be uh, working on at the same time <laughs> we fighting against the military dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we are seeing and, and hearing a lot of kind of tragic, really traumatic uh, uh, stories coming from Myanmar now and all of us are overwhelmed with the tragedy, but uh, uh, what is the hope? Uh, do you feel hope and how you will articulate and describe the hope of the country in this moment? Yes, I think determination is the biggest hope we now earning, you know. Determination from the, the people of Myanmar uh, the slogan saying that nobody can govern us without our will. This determination is very hopeful for me, you know. Now they came to their sense, you know. E even in the past, you know, uh, people were asked to vote this party, that party, so and so. It sounded like uh, political elites or the politi uh, politicians can lead the country. But people now saying that, okay, whoever have the knowledge, but without our voluntary will, nobody can govern us. So this determination is pretty strong. It's, it's very hopeful if the political uh, leadership can make this into the right direction, you know. This kind of determination can make anything can happen. It's a bit scary <laughs> in the sense if we cannot handle it well, but uh, according to this four months experience, I think people have shown they are willing next to do the democracy, uh, to end the inequality, such and such. So it's a critical moment right now, but I I still have this kind of hope, you know. The people, we cannot underestimate them. They are the key, uh, The only the political parties or political leadership uh, making so much effort to understand to the, the, the nature of this uh, determination by the people and then make it uh, more effective and more peaceful uh, destiny. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about this determination, I said, then it's going against the something which uh, more and more we hear into the corridors of the international politics, basically saying, oh, we need to be pragmatic, we need to accept that military is too strong, uh, that sooner or later military will prevail, and that the only way how we can avoid the catastrophe of s development like in Syria is basically to accept the new roadmap dictated by the military. What you will say to the pragmatist uh, who are selling this narrative? Well, you know, we need to aware this time the determination of the people and their perspective towards the current security forces. I mean, the national security forces is really, you know, very strong, you know, because of the handling by these national security forces, people lost their trust in the national security forces, either the police or the Tamado or the army. So this cannot make anything better, even if we focus on making the rule of law through these national security forces. Mm -hmm. That's why I think the, a lot of people, we are asking for R2P, the responsibility to protect the until and unless third party uh, security forces can make sure rule of law can be established. Otherwise, you know, the kind of the uh, circle of vicious circles of violence can be turned either by the national security forces or the combatant forces, something like that, you know. So that's why we need to uh, make sure the determination of the people of Myanmar 
is so high, there are loss of trust in the national security forces should be counted. You know, otherwise, even though you uh, can convince the, the military leaders to handle things into the stability, you know, without the cooperation from the people, nobody, even the, the, the even for the UNP Ducks forces, if people cannot accept that, you cannot make sure any rule of law. That's why it should be pretty much uh, carefully handled. Okay. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and people of Myanmar had an extraordinary relation. We could also say a little bit strange relation. And, and in a certain way, I, sometimes it looked to me that uh, her stubborn uh, rejection of the of the military junta and the devotion which the people had toward her has created this social contract in a Myanmar which basically military has not been able to break uh, even with uh, all different kinds of the violence repression and su suppression uh, you have been reflecting and writing about this relation between Aung San Suu Kyi and, uh, and the people of the country. Is it possible to describe it in a, in a, in a short way, let's say, what this relation is about? Well, I think the, we are in somehow a trap that the whole society, you know, it's like one of our limbs, or one of our the, for a person, you know, when we see our country as a person, you know, one of our limbs is already being rotten or the, the, the pretty much uh, kind of uh, in very desperate situation. So people uh, are in dilemma, especially I think Aung San Suu Kyi also in dilemma, whether we should cut off uh, this lymph, this is part of our body, or shall we try to preserve it as part of our body and make it into the healthier situation, something like that. So our uh, army, Tamaro, is that kind of limbs, that kind of uh, parts of our body already. So that's why I think the it's very, very hard for the whole population and any political leaders to decide which w uh, how we can be uh, becoming a fully healthy persons <laughs> compared to the others. That's th this kind of the one part of the body. It's making almost all the time uh, very differently uh, behaving and very much rotten already. So for that. Uh, scenario, uh, we are in this trap, whether we should just take off, shall we just want to be disabled in that sense by taking off this limb or ever again with this rotten <laughs> limb, something like that. So that's why it's totally depend on, I think, the army, the, the leaders of the army, the Tamador, because, you know, it's had so much time to change itself, but they never ever try, you know. They can be better part of the body, better part of our society by themselves, but they lost their chance every single time. They, they, you know, they make this 2008 constitution. This is the key they can make themselves as a a uh, healthier part of the society by changing this, by reviewing this, by making themselves. But they never ever also think of the army as a institution. You know, most of the army leaders never count their own institution army to make change. Mm -hmm. So that's how they destroy not just the country, but also their own institution. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem, I think. And do you have an uh, explanation why the coup happened? Uh, many, really many people are asking, you know, military has been very comfortable with uh, 
2008 constitution, they have been controlling businesses, they have basically lived in an impunity still. So what, what has been the reason? Well, we, we need to be very carefully watch back the roadmap. The seven steps roadmap, you know, the military has been uh, started introducing. So part of this, it was an election as a tool uh, to make sure military going to have a legitimate power. Without election, military cannot have a legitimate power. That's how they want to end up their destination. So that's for that reason. Coup is the kind of the one uh, ultimate weapon to maintain its power. But the, with their roadmap, they never ever willing to give up their power. This is how we need to understand the mindset of the military, you know. That's why you might notice uh, all things the, the, within these four months, the military has been uh, doing is uh, going back to uh, the situation before 2015, you know. So the, all the things, the energy, the civilian government has been done should be reversed. This is their <laughs> aim. They just want to, uh, why they say this was not the coup, it's just going to uh, control the, uh, maintain the power. It's just want to keep its legitimacy. What they have missed in the past is the legitimacy, not the power. Even under the civilian government, they can still hold the power through three ministries, through the position of the commander-in-chief, everything, but not the legitimacy. That's why I think they just want to undermine the result of the uh, election, because it is the sole legitimacy of the opposition party or the people of Myanmar. What you know, ordinary but active people in the Czech Republic uh, can and should do uh, for, for people in your country? Well, it's hard to say, you know. Yeah, we, we should be the sole responsible populations to change our own society. So, but I still believe, like Mr. Harvard, like yourself and the other uh, people of the international community can still help us and support us in the way your uh, kind of interests. Sometimes, you know, uh, even we have been encouraged and supported by a lot of the international community, but their understanding of uh, complexity of our uh, problems, difficulties, that structure, the ethnicity, the religion, everything, it's not uh, pretty much supportive. <laughs> so I hope, uh, yeah, learning uh, our complexity, trying to understand more about our complexity will help us, reassure us, being understood by the international community. I think this is pretty much important. That's why I think the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi herself once told the, uh, the community, uh, international community, I prefer to the friends of Myanmar to understand us. Mm -hmm. In order to support us, first to understand us is the most important thing. Uh, and I was thinking what I would like to do if I go back to the free Myanmar, uh, then I always imagine myself inviting all my friends, which I know in Myanmar, uh, somewhere to the Inya Lake, and then basically kind of having a long, long, long party. Uh, what you will do uh, in a free Myanmar? Well, as a writer, I, I was about to do uh, sort of uh, training courses. You know, I believe in order to encourage someone's freedoms or expressions to practice that kind of rights, we can solve a lot of problems. 
for that reason, I, I always focus on the rights of freedom of expressions and the linguistic rights. That's also very much uh, important. You know, for me, I, I really do hate the identity politics. But what I understand when we talk about identity, language, linguistic rights is the m one of the most important things. So I will just... Uh, do whatever I can to make sure every single person of my country to practice their freedom of expression and to claim their linguistic rights in order to make themselves pretty much strong and capable and defending themselves. So that would be my dream. Thank you very much. And I, I, I really wish your dream to come through. And I wish that we see each other next time in a free young one. Thank you so Thank you much. Thank you.